awaited savior of humanity, Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam, my respected teachers, elders, brothers, and sisters, salamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First and foremost, on this night in which we will be commemorating, striking upon the blessed head of Imam Ali alayhi salam, we extend our condolences to the awaited savior, Imam al-Mahdi ajjalallahu ta'ala faraj al-sharif. We extend our condolences to our maraja al-kiram and indeed to the mu'mineen and mu'minat and to the whole of humanity for the martyrdom anniversary of Imam Ali alayhi salam is a martyrdom anniversary that the entirety of humanity can commemorate in. So far, we have been looking at some of the initial principles for an Islamic economic system. The first thing we stated was that Islam by its very nature is a liberative force, helping people to be able to escape the trials and tragedies of life and everything that stops them from being able to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This informs the Islamic economic system, which then informs the Islamic humanitarian aid and charitable services that we provide. What are the components of an Islamic economic system? Number one, that it is not secularized. It is not independent of the system of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Number two, we mentioned that it is something that does not tolerate shirk. And when a system is set up in order to create and fuel the idea of demigods or idols with the small i, that system is supposed to be liberated from it. And we gave the examples of how in the pre-Islamic Arabian society, there used to be those idols which certain tribes had, and the rest of the tribes were expected to be able to finance those tribes with their offerings. This was number two. The second thing that we mentioned about the, well, sorry, the third economic principle is that the Islamic economic system is one that does not tolerate exploitation. And we gave the example of riba and how riba exploits the human being because it makes or takes advantage of them when they are unable to pay back their loans it actually makes them fall deeper into their system of debt, unable to be able to clamber out. Yes, individuals may be able to climb out of the system, but by and large, the system of riba is there to be able to exploit people and take their own capital away from them. We gave the examples yesterday that there were four verses of the Quran that were revealed in order to be able to help the Muslim community and the other communities wean themselves off this practice. This is an example of a liberating system from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that sometimes there has to be an intervention which stops something immediately, but at other times there needs to be an intervention which gradually helps people to be able to lift themselves out of those bad practices. We also stated that the ayat weren't just addressed to the mu'mineen, but the last ayah regarding riba was addressing the Jewish community, censuring them, that they were practicing that which they themselves knew was prohibited. And then the fourth point that we have brought so far in our series as of last night was that the Islamic economic system distributes wealth as widely as possible. And we stated the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that wealth is not supposed to circulate amongst the rich or a particular class from amongst yourselves. Rather, it is to be distributed as widely as possible. Tonight, inshallah, we will interrogate the last discussions about an Islamic economic system, the principles of it particularly in light of its liberative features, which then inform our series discussion on the charitable services that we provide 
how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this for us within the Holy Quran. Tonight, inshallah, we will talk about the following. Number one, the issue of austerity and whether Islam endorses the idea of discriminating austerity upon people. The idea that when there is an economic downturn, should the needs of people be stripped from them or actually is this a time to invest in people even more in order to stimulate an economy? How does this actually look like when it comes to the relationship between those who have in excess and those who do not, number one. Number two, the second thing that we will talk about is the question of growth or rather actually the question of degrowth. Is it that when it comes to the Islamic economic system, we prejudice the idea of consistent growth in an economy? Or is it actually that in the current state in which we live in, there is a need for us to be able to review the idea of degrowth? Where does the Quran talk about the balance between consistent growth in an economy and also degrowth in an economy? And how to be able to balance the two? And when do we actually understand the relationship in the application of these two? We will then, inshallah, of course, conclude with our commemoration of the commander of the faithful, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. In the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the issue of spending in times of increase and decrease, in times of ease and in times of comfort. When we take a step back and see what our government has done to many of the different services in the United Kingdom, we have seen that for a decade there has been an underinvestment or a pulling out of investment in many services. Those services, for example, have been the NHS. There has been a cut in the number of police officers on the street. We have seen, for example, the local services around providing youth with space to be able to gather. All of these cuts have come off the back of what has been argued a need for austerity, a need for us to be able to decrease the amount of expenditure into our public services in order to be able to balance the books. And of course, there is great merit to this argument and understanding as to why this might need to take place. A person, a community, a family can only spend what they have available to them. Yet at the same time, we have seen an increase in spending in other areas. For example, there has been an increase in military spending. And therefore one is immediately allowed to ask the question, why is it that spending in some areas can increase, but a decrease in other areas have to be seen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about a number of different civilizations in the Quran. And certain chapters of the Quran the themes of them have been dedicated towards the issue of the building of a civilization in light of the Muslim community. Most famous amongst those chapters that deal with civilization building is Surah Al-Rum, chapter number 30 of the Holy Quran. We will, inshallah, tonight on the 21st, on the 23rd night, we will try to recite three chapters of the Quran which are dedicated towards Layali al Qadr. Amongst them is Surah al Rum. It's recommended to be recited tonight. Also, Al Anqabut and Al Dukhan. For many of us, we will try to recite Al Rum tonight or across these three nights. When you are reading Surah al Rum, reflect on these ayats and see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the idea of the downfall of the civilization of Arum and its challenge with the Persian Empire and try to understand its relationship towards the civilization building of the Muslim Ummah 
in contrast to it. There are other chapters as well that speak to this issue. For example, Surah Maryam also speaks to the issue of civilization building, another topic for another night, inshallah. In verses 37 to 38 of Surah Al Rum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provides us with two verses that speak to the issue of spending, even though times may be hard, even though there is going to be financial restriction upon a community, that actually even then the spending upon people who are in need does not stop. Many verses speak to this issue as well. But just to give you a flavor of what the Quran says about this issue of spending in times of need. Verse number 37. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Awalam yaro Do they not see that Allah gives much ample amount to anyone whom he wills? Or if he decides to restrict it, it is again whom he wills. Every individual goes through times of economic increase and decrease. Every community goes through exactly the same. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala changes the circumstances of people cyclically within their lives. When a community undergoes those financial restrictions, for whatever reason it may be, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala follows up with the subsequent verse, verse number 38. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states. So give. Now think about this. Allah states that there are going to be people who are going through hard times. They're going to undergo restrictions in their financial capacity. Does Allah then state that you should pull back from expenditure at that time? That you actually reduce the availability for people to help themselves? If a community is going through a downturn economically, then surely that is the time when people are more in need of support, not less in need of support. Is it not counterproductive then to say that when a community is going through hard times to pull the rug from under them and actually pull up and away from them the very financing that they actually need and the investment that they need to be able to survive? So give relatives their rights. Well, miskeen as well as the needy. وابن السبيل and the traveler. Why? ذلك خير للذين يريدون وجه الله. That is the best for those who seek the pleasure of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. وأولئك هم المفلحون. They are the ones who will be successful. Actually, another way to translate this is they are the ones who will be prosperous. It is interesting in the siyak of these ayat the internal coherence of these two verses of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts from one perspective by saying there are people whose sust uh, uh, sustenance is going to be reduced. In the next verse, Allah says spend. And then Allah concludes it by saying they will be the ones who are prosperous. You'll be able to come out of this circumstance not by pulling away from people, but by actually helping people who are in need. From this angle, we reject the idea of austerity when a society is in need. What is interesting, actually, is that the language around Islamic taxation is actually a language of growth. Often we feel deprived. You open up the paycheck and say, ah, whatever the tax rate is upon you, you know, there's a bit of a curse towards the government and whatever else, and oh, they don't use it right. From the Islamic perspective, taxation is actually located in the root of growth itself. Zakat, the word zakat, is derived from the same root as tezkiyah, which is purification. Zakawa, the three root letters, have a root meaning of purity and growth. When someone does tezkiyah to nafs, they purify their own soul, 
they grow, don't they? A person right now who is in a state of fasting, the idea is that they grow from this. It is not a reduction in their soul. Similarly, zakat, even in the financial sense, is a purification of the wealth that is also supposed to be a growth of the wealth as well. It has been suggested in the dictionary Lisan al-Arab, volume 14, page 358, that the reason for calling arms zakat lies in the fact that paying zakat purifies one's money and possessions. It is also true that paying arms causes growth and blessings, barakat, in one's money and in one's sustenance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this in the Quran. In chapter number 9, verse 103, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةٌ Take from them. Take charity from their possessions. Why? To tahiruhum, To purify them. وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا And to cleanse them by it. وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنُ لَهُمْ وَاللَّهُ سَمِيعٌ عَلِيمٌ That there is a blessing in this when you actually perform this. Now, many ahadith tell us that there have been times when our uh, early societies, Muslim societies, have gone through periods of financial hardship. Ahlul Bayt reacted in such a way that they actually ensured that what was available with them decreased in order so that what was available for others increased. There was an equalization between them. This is very important. I'm going to mention these two narrations, but I want you to hold on to them when it comes to the idea of growth versus degrowth. Okay? First hadith comes to us from our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq. Salawatullah wa salamuhu alayhi. Imam alayhi salam in this hadith in Medina al-Munawwara, there was a there was a, a, a period of famine that hit Medina al-Munawwara. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam has a hadith now where he turns towards his servant and he says, Kam indina min ta'am. How much food do we have with us? His servant responded by saying, Ma yakfina ashhuran. What suffices us for months. We have with us a store that amounts to Enough for us to be able to survive a period during this famine. Qala alayhi salam, the Imam responded by saying, Ukhrujhu wa bi'hu. Take it out of our stores and sell it. We have food available for several weeks. Take it out and sell it. Faqala al Khadim, the Khadim responds by saying, Laysa fil madinat al ta'am. But there isn't food in Medina. What are you doing? How can you tell us to go and sell the food that we have? Imam alayhi salam responds and says, Bi'hu wa ishtar ma'annasi yawman bi yawmin. Sell it and you should purchase your food day by day, just like the rest of the people of Medina also have to be able to purchase their food day by day. Now, normally what we do is we respond by saying, subhanAllah, what a phenomenal example this imam is. And we move on from the narration. Reflect on this narration in the context of dealing with austerity. Reflect on it in the context of an equalization between what a people have or what a family unit or what a community has when they have more than their need, more than their share, and when others have less than their need or less than their share. The Imam alayhi salam here demonstrates actually an economic principle for you and I that equalizes the amount available for everyone because his household was not more important than every or any other household. If there is another household that is going to go without it became incumbent upon the imam to be able to make that available to the people such that everybody was able to have enough of that share. Another hadith from the same imam, um, uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahu wa salamuhu This hadith says, Inna ahl al-Madina asabahum qahd 
حتى أن رجل مسوء موسرة كان يخرط الحنطة بالشعير ويأكله. There came a time upon the people of Medina it befell them a time of drought such that a person al muwassira a person who was able well able to pay his zakat meaning a wealthy person he had to mix hunta and sha'ir in order to be able to eat it barley and wheat a most basic type of foodstuffs he would have to survive them وَكَانَ عِنْدَ الصَّادِقِ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ طَعَامٌ جَيِّدٌ But there was a food with Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam that was good. It was tasty. It was nutritious. فَقَالَ لِخَادِمِهِ He said towards his khadim, اِشْتَرْ لَنَا شَعِيرًا فَخْلُقْتْ بِهَذَا الطَّعَامِ وَبِعْعَ الْقُمْحِ He said, buy for us the shair. The same type of things that they are eating and mix it with our food and sell the better food that we have, sell the grain that we have. We dislike that we get to eat well whilst other people eat in a scanty way. Subhanallah. Think about the practical measure that the Imam alayhi salam made in order to be able to demonstrate that when people are going without, it is upon those who have their excess more than their share to be able to get rid of their share to be able to help those people who need. This tells us something very important when it comes to the issue of spending in times of need. That those people who have during times of need it is expected upon them to be able to invest in those people who do not have. Normally, what happens in our minds is we need to save even more. Or what you saw during the beginning of the pandemic was that people would rush towards the stores in order to buy such that they would monopolize and not allow everybody equal access to it. Do you remember the beginning of the pandemic? What was the one thing that everybody wanted? Loo rolls. Do you remember that? Yeah? Everybody went out to go and buy loo rolls thinking that, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, actually. I don't want to even think about what they were thinking about. Everybody went and bought loo rolls. People wanted to buy hand sanitizer, right? And for the period of at least a few weeks, you saw our shelves become empty. This is actually called ihtikar in the Islamic economic system, monopolization. And it is absolute, absolutely haram. I would argue that amongst the strongest of narrations against a person to describe a type of hellfire, this is my humble statement to you. I cannot think of a stronger narration from Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam that decries the act of al-ihtikar, of monopolization. When people who are going without, you hoard what is needed. Historically, historically, the narrations of Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam limited al-ihtikar to primary foodstuffs, wheat and barley and salt and things like that. Our maraja al-kiram today interpret those narrations and say it is not specifically limited to those foodstuffs. It is anything that a human being needs anything that a human being needs if you hoard it this has some of the most harshest narrations about punishment from ahlul bayt alayhi wasalam and if you want we can talk about it another time i don't want to dwell on the matter too much inshallah sallu ala muhammad wa ali muhammad here has been the fifth point about the Islamic economic system, and that is about spending in times of increase as well as decrease. What I wish to be able to speak about for the remainder of the discussion, inshallah, is to be talking about the issue of growth versus degrowth. The Holy Quran provides us with a number of verses that talk to us about 
that the human being has the right to be able to utilize everything Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us. Traditionally, our ulama, may Allah bless them, have understood this in the itlaqi sense. They have stated that there is the principle of absolutism in using whatever we want from the earth. This is normally under what is known as isalatul bara'ah, principle of exemption. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that we have created the heavens and the universe for you to use. Therefore, there is itlaq on this statement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said it in the absolute sense. He has not said it with some sort of qaid. He has not said it in some sort of narrow sense. What I wish to be able to do from the Quran is to challenge this notion tonight and suggest that actually the Quran has been misinterpreted here and that there is no principle of itlaq on usage of the resources that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided to us. Why? Because the resources that are provided to us are not available to us in their infinite sense. They are going to run out. There is a limitation as to the availability of those natural resources. So how can you provide itlaq on them? How can you provide an absolution on something that is going to run out? When you drove here, did you provide itlaq on, your, on the amount of petrol in your tank? No you realize that you have to be able to use it to a certain amount. If you use more than is available to you, you will run out. What happens when you run out? What happens if you run out, if you over consume food? What happens if we over consume oil and gas? What happens if we over consume the trees that are available to us? What's going to happen? What I wish to be able to demonstrate is those ayat which suggest to us the itlaq, that we can use whatever we want, that has until today been interpreted through the principle of itlaq, and then actually to show you where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us not to use all of these resources too quickly with absolute means of them. Three verses of the Quran that are normally cited by our maraji al-kiram, may Allah bless them, that talk about absolute usage is available to you. Principle of itlaq and the principle of isalatul bara'ah. Chapter number 65, Surah Al-Mulk, verse number 17. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa alladhi ja'ala lakum al-arda dhalulan. It is he who has made the earth tamed for you. Made it easy for you. It's very hard for me to translate the word dhalulan into one way. But I will translate it in saying it is made easy for you to manipulate. And it is the case. The earth is made easy for us to be able to dig into. The earth has been made easy for us to extrapolate whatever the resources are from within it. Be it the iron ore or be it gas or be it anything else. It is he who has tamed the earth for you. So travel its regions. Meaning what? Become as expansive as possible across the earth to understand the earth, what, has, what it has in it to be able to use it for you. And eat of his provision. Consume from his provision. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, nushur, And unto him you shall be resurrected. Meaning what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us something that says, be careful. When you use, be careful how you use. In this ayah, our ulama, may Allah bless them, have normally understood this as itlaq. Allah says, kulu, partake from it, utilize it as you wish. Therefore, there is itlaq. Chapter number two, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse number 29. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Huwa alladhi khalaqa lakum ma fil ardi jami'an. He, he, it is he who has created for you all that the earth contains. Does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala qualify this? No. So therefore it's absolute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. 
chapter number 7, verse number 10. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ We have given you power over the earth. وَجَعَلْنَا لَكُمْ فِيهَا مَعَايِشْ And we have made for you ways to live, ways of livelihood to be able to live on this earth. قَلِيلًا مَا تَشْكُرُونَ However, little do you give thanks for this power and this livelihood that we have given to you. And here it's a very interesting point. The first ayah said, be careful, you're going to be resurrected. You're going to be held to account for how you use everything. In this ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, not about resurrection, about gratitude. An ungrateful person is the one who utilizes something more than his right. Who doesn't think about the right of that thing and utilizes it in a wrong way. Doesn't attribute Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to it. Allah says, how little thankful you are that I've made this earth for you and given you so much authority and power over this earth. وَلَقَدْ مَكَّنَّاكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ Now here, as we stated, till now, Till now, the way in which these ayats have been understood is that the human being is allowed the principle of consumption and exploitation of the planet. We have general permissibility to be able to do so. As an example, in his tafsir, in his commentary, Ayatollah Sheikh Hadi Ma'rifat, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, quote, states, and I quote, this is amongst the foremost principles that permission is given to mankind to make use and enjoy everything in nature, whatever does not prohibit or harass another person's right. So here there is a slight contextualization to that. And Alama Muqaddis Ad-Dabali, Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alay, one of the greatest scholars, says these ayat indicate towards permissibility of living anywhere on earth traveling anywhere without restriction until there is an evidence to state otherwise. Now, in the modern context in which we live, we have to remember that we live under what is absolutely a colonial ideology. That is to say that everything is available for a person to be able to conquer and utilize. And definitely this started when the Americas were found. Of course, they weren't found. There were already indigenous people living there. The idea is that we have been able to, for the last 500 years, take from whoever we want and however we want and utilize however we want. This arguably may be similar to the idea of itlaq or the idea of absolution given to us to be able to use things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has several ayat in the Quran where he says, actually, you cannot utilize everything how you want to be able to utilize. There has to be some limitations placed upon you. In fact, not only does he state this, he actually has verses where he says, those societies that have misused the resources given to them, Allah himself has destroyed them for their abuse of the natural resources. So these verses have to be understood. Either we say everything is permissible for us to be able to utilize until we find harm, or we actually state the opposite, that we have to be able to utilize the resources of Allah in a just manner. And permission is given to us to be able to utilize them as long as it is for the common good, as long as it is to everyone's benefit. Chapter number 46, verse number 20. Please note this verse. See how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about this. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَيَوْمَ يُعْرَضُ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا عَلَى النَّارِ أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ أَذْهَبْتُمْ طَيِّبَاتِكُمْ the Arabic here is really interesting. On the day when the unbelievers will be exposed to the punishment of fire, what will be said to them? 
أذهبتم طيباتكم في حياتكم الدنيا You squandered the good things that you had in this worldly life أذهبتم So that which departed went away طيباتكم The good things, the pure things that were given to you في حياتكم الدنيا In your worldly life now, the Arabic here is very interesting. For those of you who know the Arabic language, we have something called Zahir al Kalam, understanding the apparent of what has been said to you. Yeah? Hayatikum, your life. You used, you squandered the tayyibat fi hayatikum in your life. How long is a person's life? Approximately. 50, 60, 70 years. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you squandered the goods that were given to you in one lifespan. In one life, fi hayatikum, in your life. We were given all of these blessings of rainforests. We were given these blessings of oil. How many a community squanders it even within the space of 70, 100 years? أذهبتم طيباتكم في حياتكم الدنيا واستمتعتم بها and you took your portion and just made it a pleasure to you therein does this verse not tell us something about our utilization of our resources the value of the economy and making sure that it is available for everyone at large واستمتعتم بها this is what we told to certain people on the day of judgment. May Allah protect us. This is a verse of warning. So today you are repaid with the punishment of humiliation because of your unjustifiable arrogance on the earth. And because of your transgressing all bounds. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we gave you tayyibat, but be careful how you utilize those tayyibat. Another verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that he destroys a community because of their abuse of the wealth and the resources that they are given. Chapter number 28, verse 58. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَكَمْ أَهْلَكْنَا مِنْ قَرِيَةٍ بَطِرَتْ مَعِيشَتَهَا فَتِلْكَ مَسَاكِنُكُمْ لَمْ تُسْكَمْ مِنْ بَعْدِهِمْ إِلَّا قَلِيلٍ or إِلَّا قَلِيلًا وَكُنَّا نَحْنُ الْوَارِثِينَ How many a community that once exulted in its wealth and ease of life did we destroy so that none, so that, of the, so that those dwelling in their places were destroyed all but a few of them now have people living in them. Indeed, we alone are the ones who shall remain when all else has passed away. Now, the reason why I'm telling you this about our economy is that the way in which we understand our economy from the Western world is that economy is constantly about growth, about GDP, about the number of jobs, and so on. From an Islamic perspective, the economy is ultimately our material relationship with one another and with the rest of the living universe. We have to decide whether we want that relationship to be based on how much we can extrapolate and how much we can exploit from each other and the living universe or based on re re uh, re recipro reciprocity and care. In the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks to us about the obligation that we have to be able to protect our blessings and our resources. In chapter number 16, verse number 112, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states, وَذَرَبَ اللَّهُ مَثَلًا قَرِيَةً كَانَتْ آمِنَةً مُطْمَئِنَّةً يَأْتِيهَا رِزْقُهَا رَغَدًا مِنْ كُلِّ مَكَانٍ فَكَفَرَتْ بِأَنْعُمِ اللَّهِ so 
Subhanallah. Allah proposes you a parable, an example. Imagine a town that was once safe and secure with all of its provisions coming to it in abundance from multiple places. فكفرت. But then they denied, they did kufr. فكفرت بأن عم الله. They denied the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah caused it to experience hunger and fear as a result of what they have done. There are many, many other verses that talk about the same thing, about the protection of our blessings. And then we don't use them in the right way. They turn into sufferings for us. I won't list the verses. There are several verses of the Quran that we could have mentioned. For the sake of brevity and to finish on time, I will skip those verses. If you want them, you can see them in your own time. I'll send them to you, inshallah. Now, the issue of degrowth. We stated here that we argue, I argue from the Quran, that we are not supposed to be able to utilize our resources beyond our means. And that when we first interpreted these verses through the idea of itlaq, being able to use them absolutely for our own ideas and goals, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala suggests to us otherwise. To understand the imbalance that we have within our global society will help us to be able to pivot towards how Islam speaks about a globalized, just and balanced economy. You'll recall that a few minutes earlier, we gave to you two narrations from our sixth Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam gave us the example of the equalization between peoples. He in his household had enough, more than enough. Others were going without. Therefore he gave away or sold two people so that they were able to have what was needed. Some of the latest economic studies, especially by masters of their science, such as Jason Hinkle, states the following. For every one dollar of aid, remember we're talking about economy and our aid that we provide to people. For every one dollar of aid the global south receives, they lose $14 through unequal exchange with the north the global north. Every one dollar that we give in aid, not even business, that we give in aid, in business terms, they are losing $14 because of the way in which we have set up the global economy. Poor countries are developing the rich countries, not the other way around. Often we think that when we give money to Iraq, to Palestine or to Pakistan or to Yemen or to Syria, we imagine that we are supporting. But in reality, if the economies are so skewered against them that their resources are being taken and not being financed back into those countries, then actually all we are doing is pushing them further and further and further behind. What happens? We get more and more videos about the desperation of people and it is more and more expected that we put into our pockets to be able to help people. The aid goes, but in reality, they're becoming further and further and further behind in the real world terms. According to the latest studies, it is estimated that the drain on the global south through this unequal exchange has totaled $62 trillion between 1960 and 2018, or $152 trillion US dollars, accounting for lost growth. Let's give a specific example so that you understand. Currently, 800 million hectares, that's twice the size of India. India has how many people? 1.1 1.1 billion people living in it. Twice the size of India is appropriated in the global south for the purpose of consumption by the West. That's how much we in the, in the, in the global West utilize from the global south. 
This is how much of an unequal exchange there is between people. Degrowth, instead of constant growth in the idea of economy, calls for a reduction of resource and energy output by rich nations in order to get back within the planetary boundaries. What do we state earlier? There shouldn't be itlaq on resource. There should not be an absolute usage of consumption when it comes to our natural resources. Degrowth says that the global north has to be able to cut back in such a way that it gets back within its planetary boundaries so that poorer nations can increase their output in order to meet their basic human needs. What did we say Imam al-Sadiq did? He gave away and sold his own food in order that others could have an equilibrium and a balance between them. This is the idea of degrowth. That the West reduces its usage in order to allow for the global South to increase the usage of their own space in order to be able to meet their basic human needs. It is, in other words, a demand for a radical governance of global justice. The mere placing of green lens on the existing model is not actually a paradigm shift. When we talk about the Islamic economic system was supposed to be able to shift away and upend the systems of oppression, this is actually what we are talking about, not just putting a green spin on the matters itself. Normally, our metrics of looking at the uh, GDP of a society does not take into consideration the sustainability or the durability of the resources that are available, and nor is it the best way for us to be able to gauge the development of a society, or there are other metrics that we could actually use. The metrics that we use to be able to identify what is occurring in a society needs to be reflected on. And this is what we were talking about a little bit yesterday, Sayyidina. How much does a person in the global south tend to earn per day? It is up to $1.20 per day. Can you imagine surviving on $1.20 a day? We're talking about everything that you need, your housing, your schooling, your electricity, your food, your clothing, your water, $1.20 a day. According to economists in this field, how much is needed per day just to be able to have the minimal needed nutrition for normal life expectancy? $7.40 a day. In other countries, for example, in the United States of America, it is expected that people should earn $15 an hour just to be able to reach the poverty line. And this is still being fought over. I don't know how many of you follow US politics on a regular basis. There is still the demand for a minimal wage of $15 an hour. $7.40 a day is needed for minimal amount of nutrition. Income and consumption does not tell us the whole story about poverty. Poverty is multidimensional, and some aspects of human well being can be obscured by consumption figures alone. To achieve this kind of understanding of $7.40 a day minimal for every human being, just to be able to reach nutrition, we would need to change the economic policies to make it a fairer one for the world's majority. We would also then need to take into account the crisis of climate change, ecological breakdown, which threatens all of the gains that people might make towards $7.40 a day. Ultimately, as we stated earlier on, we defined the 
Islamic economic system. And I want to reiterate it now so that you think about it as we close in order to remember Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And I stated the following. The economy in the Islamic perspective is ultimately our material relationship with each other and with the rest of the world. We have to decide what type of relationship we want, whether it's based on extrapolation and exploitation or on reciprocity and on care. It cannot be that the Islamic economic system does not take all of these factors into account. Rather, it does. And the Islamic economic system takes into account the well-being of the human. Every aspect of the well-being of the human needs to be taken into consideration of the Islamic economic system. The well-being of our health care. The well-being of our nutrition. Our life expectancy. Our social mobility. Our ability to travel and exchange and have equal footing with everybody else on this planet are the root metrics of an Islamic economic system. And without those being at the center point of the Islamic economic system, when we talk about Islamic aid, and we talk about financially investing in people through our sadaqat and our khums and our zakat, if these two things suddenly work independent of each other, then believe it when I say that the Islamic economic system is going to fail, and the way in which we implement our khums and our zakat and our sadaqa is also going to fail. Because all we are going to end up doing is putting a plaster on a very, very big wound. Maybe even a plaster on a decapitation. If all we are doing is putting in aid and sadaqa and khums into things that are not organized in accordance with the Islamic economy, our funds are really going to waste. And this is why we have started these lectures by thinking about what an Islamic economic system looks like, which then informs the humanitarian aid policies that we will start talking about from tonight, inshallah. On a night like tonight, the greatest example of the one who looked after the needs of the poor, the needs of the disenfranchised, the needs of the orphan and the widow was none other than Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahu salamuhu alayhi. It was in moments like this just before the setting on the night of the 19th of Shahr Ramadan, all those years ago, Ali ibn Abi Talib was invited to break his fast at the house of his daughter, Sayyida Umm Kulthum, salamullahi alayhima. This is a man who the narration says lifted the gates of Khaybar with one hand. Yet, when it came to him eating bread, the bread that he ate was so hard and stale that he was unable to break the bread on his knee. This is the man that when he saw any amount of injustice, he would not be able to tolerate it. When someone would come to him, or when he would walk the streets and he would see someone who was impoverished lying on the streets in need, he would say to his companions, those who would have the responsibility of sharing from Beit al-Mal, he would say, what is this that I am seeing? The companion would say that this is a Christian or this is a Jew. This is not a person who is putting into Beit al-Mal. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib would respond by saying, I didn't ask you who he was. I asked you, what is he going through? What is his situation? And immediately Ali ibn Abi Talib would write a stipend for him from Beit al-Mal. It is this Ali ibn Abi Talib that is invited 
to break his iftar at the house of his daughter, as Sayyida Umm Kulthum alayhi salam. The narration state that Sayyida Umm Kulthum has prepared for Ali ibn Abi Talib some bread, some salt, and some milk. Such a small iftar that Ali ibn Abi Talib is going to break his fast with. She presents it in front of him. Ali ibn Abi Talib says, Oh my dear daughter, since when have you seen your father break his fast with three things? Take one of them away and this is what I will have my iftar on tonight. As the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib, knowing that Ali must have been so hungry, so hungry that he made sure that his hunger matched or even excelled the hungriest person in his city. What do you take away from the plate of Ali ibn Abi Talib? Do you take away the salt that it is recommended for you to be able to open your fast with? Do you take away a little bit of bread that Ali ibn Abi Talib might be able to fill his stomach with? Do you take away a milk so that he is still thirsty at the end of his fast? It is said that she took away a little bit of milk. Another narration says that she took away the bread that maybe he he was just left with a little bit of salt and a little bit of bread to be able to break his fast with tonight. It was on this night that as the night began to settle in, Ali ibn Abi Talib began to seem very restless. He would walk in and he would walk out of his house. He would walk in and he would walk out of his house. He would look up towards the sky and he would look up towards the moon and say, ah, indeed, this is the night in which I have been promised by Rasulullah. This is the night of destiny that shall befall me. It is said that Sayyidah Umm Kulthum said to him, oh, my father, I have not heard such words from you. Tell me what words are you speaking? He responded by saying, this is the the night that my cousin and my brother has promised me this is the night of my striking so lady umm kulthum could not bear to hear these words how does the daughter hear these words that are going to befall upon her father such as ali ibn abi talib the narration says that ali ibn abi talib spent his night in worship. He would perform his ghusl. He would clean his clothes. He would recite Quran. He would perform his prayers. But throughout the night, he was in a state of perplexion. He was in a night in a state of distress. It comes towards the early morning. The narration says that he sends Imam al Hassan and Hussein towards the masjid to tell them to be able to tell someone to lead the salah. But yet, now it is Ali ibn Abi Talib's time to come towards performing his salah. He leaves his house for this last time. It is said that at this moment, there are geese that walk in front of him. They begin to squawk. They begin to squawk in front of Ali ibn Abi Talib. One can only imagine what the geese were saying. They might have been saying, Ya Ali, do you know that there is a killer who is waiting there to be able to hit you on the head? Please do not go. Please do not leave us, O oh Ali, because if you leave us, we do not have anyone like you, our Imam. It is said that Imam Ali turns towards Sayyidina Umm Kulthum and says to her, free these geese. If you can feed them, then feed them. But if you can't, then free them, for they will be able to find their own sustenance. Allah will look after their sustenance. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib enters in towards the masjid. It is said that at this moment he, li he sees lying on the floor Ibn Muljim, the one who is going to strike him in a few moments time. The narration says he wakes Ibn Muljim up to pray his salah. As he does so, he begins to recite lines of poetry. He wishes death upon me, but I wish for him life. I wish for him life in dunya and life in akhirah. But yet he wishes to be able to kill me and to dispatch me towards Allah. Ali ibn Abi Talib begins his prayers. Imagine the prayers of Ali in this moment as he is standing in front of his Lord. At this moment, Ibn Muljim comes forward. He pulls out that sword. He is doused it in so much poison. He strikes it upon the blessed head of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Jibreel calls out, the pillars of guidance have been demolished. The rope between the heavens and the earth has been severed. The cousin of the 
Prophet has been killed. Ali has been murdered. Ali ibn Abi Talib falls towards the floor. A pool of blood circles Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ibn Muljim runs out of Masjid Kufa to escape. It is said that Ali ibn Abi Talib has to be picked up and has to be aided to be limping out of Masjid Kufa. Imagine Imam al Hassan under one arm, Imam al Hussein under the other arm, bringing him out. Ali ibn Abi Talib is so weak at this moment. It is said that Ibn Muljib is captured and brought in front of him. This, this breaks our heart. Ibn Muljib is panicking. Ibn Muljib is thirsty. Ali ibn Abi Talib says to Imam al Hassan, please let, let go of his chains a little bit because he seems to be in discomfort. He seems like he is thirsty. Give him some water to drink. Ibn Muljim's thirst is quenched at this moment. The narration says that word has reached the house of Zainab in Umm Kulthum. I wonder how the word reached them. Was it because the earth began to shake when Ali ibn Abi Talib was struck on the head? The word has reached Zainab in Umm Kulthum. The hadith says Umm Kulthum comes running out of her house. She reaches where Ibn Muljim is. She says, oh Ibn Muljim, you have done my father no harm. She means that you have not done my father any harm. Ali ibn Abi Talib is still with Allah. The message of Ali ibn Abi Talib shall remain. Ibn Muljim misunderstands this. He addresses Umm Kulthum and says, oh Umm Kulthum, know that I have doused this sword in so much poison that if I was to strike 1,000 people of Kufa, it would dispatch them all. This is the amount of poison that is running in the head of Ali ibn Abi Talib now. Allah la'anatullahi ala al-qawmi al-dhalimeen. Wa sayya'alamu al-lazina zalamu ayyubun qalami qalibun inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to hasten the appearance of Imam al-Mahdi alayhi salam to allow us to be alongside him at all times in our life and in our death. If we are to pass away from this world before his coming, Ya Allah, raise us from our graves so that we can partake in the victories of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Ya Allah, on this night, we are going to enter into the night of Qadr. Help us to be able to worship you as you deserve. Help us to be able to read the Quran and reflect upon the Quran and the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib as is deserved. Ya Allah, grant us the ziyara of Ali ibn Abi Talib fi dunya wal akhirah. Ya Allah, accept our hajats bi haqqi Ali ibn Abi Talib fi dunya wal akhirah. And in the last moments of our life, we are granted the visitation of Ali ibn Abi Talib such that he takes our hand and leads us towards paradise, insha'Allah. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.